All right. So um, greetings, everyone, from uh, on behalf of uh, Fiends Board of Directors, Friends of Fiends, and uh, all of our many uh, Fiends Fellows and Collaborators. Welcome to the inaugural Fiends Global Visiting Professor Program. My name is Gail Rousseau. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of Fiends, and it is my distinct honor and privilege to be able to welcome you this morning. This lecture series is intended to be another way of uniting our global neurosurgery community. Our goal is to, uh, on it, initially on an every other month basis, but eventually monthly, have a series of useful lectures the, that become discussions that uh, are hosted by a Fiends Fellow. Uh, and the, the speakers will be senior neurosurgeons who are friends of Fiends. The idea being to move forward in partnership and neurosurgical education together. So we look forward to your participation and your suggestions. I'll be back at the end to tell you more about what to expect in the rest of 2021. But now it is my great honor to introduce to you uh, former, and I should say always, Fiends Fellow, Ignatius Essien from Cameroon, who is the host of today's program. Welcome, Ignatius. Thank you so much, Dr. Russo. The honor is mine. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's a great honor and pleasure for me today to welcome all of you to the inaugural uh, session of the Global Visiting Professor Webinar Series organized by the Foundation for International Education in Neurological Surgery. We know a uh, stroke and stroke related conditions constitute a major uh, part of essential neurosurgical practice. And in recent years, the question that has been asked is, uh, uh, what is the place of uh, cerebrovascular disease in uh, neurosurgical practice? Because we see in most meetings, maybe aside uh, AVMs and uh, aneurysms, little uh, maybe time is accorded to cerebrovascular diseases. So today, uh, we're going to be answering the question, what is the importance of the cerebrovascular disease in the future of global neurosurgery training and practice? And this is going to be answered by Professor Dempsey. Uh, this is a picture we took in California in 2018 during the StrongNet uh, meeting. Professor Dempsey is uh, the chair of the Department of Neurological Surgery in the University of Wisconsin Madison in the United States. Uh, he is the current chair of the Foundation for International Education in Neurological Surgery. But he occupies, he wears so many caps in so many international organizations. But one of the most important, for which he's known for, is his work on the cerebrovascular diseases which he established most of the programs in the United States and these are known worldwide. Today, Professor Dempsey is going to be talking to us about the importance of cerebrovascular disease in the future of global neurosurgery. Professor Dempsey, you have this floor now. Thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to first of all say hello and welcome everyone. Uh, we hope that this will be one of many ongoing programs that FIENDS has developed. And just in summary, FIENDS, of course, is all about international education. It has been dedicated for over 50 years to that concept as the way that we can participate to change the needs of our patients worldwide by training young neurosurgeons in training programs in their own regions, which they take ownership of for. And to do that, we must be very forward thinking we must think about education, but there are several important concepts. I'm going to share a screen now, take a moment for me. Uh, it's the concepts that I want to talk about during this particular presentation are rather straightforward. What we do in neurosurgery is driven by what our patients need. We are often tempted to simply do what is neat or what's exciting to us. And therefore we might migrate toward a particular operation and we could run the risk of just focusing on that. 
So if we really want to know what the patient's future is, it's what their needs are, and that should be the future of neurosurgery. And therefore, we must tailor education programs to that, which I assure you is exciting, is fulfilling work. But how we do that is based on science, so I want to talk about that today. And it's based on understanding as surgeons, we adapt clinical science to the patient need and be able to develop our techniques in that way, diagnosis, technique, recovery. And I'm going to argue that stroke is one of the two huge areas of patient need into the future. I'm gonna spend a little time talking about two basic techniques that all of us should do today. And one, which all of us will be doing in the future, all of us in throughout the world. And that's our job in Fiends is to make sure that the education, the equipment and the drive are there. So with that in mind, let's look at this concept of cerebral vascular disease in the future of a neurosurgical practice and the training that we develop and how fiends could play a role in that. I think if we understand that, we understand quite a bit. Also, from my own experience, I can assure you by trying to be expert in cerebral vascular disease, the techniques are immediately applicable throughout all of our practice. And those are not only surgical techniques, those are diagnostic, knowing the entire patient. You can't take care of cerebral vascular disease without taking care of the heart, the lungs, the coagulation factors, infection, et cetera. And adapt the techniques, as I'll show you a couple, to all of your surgery. So if you, if you think about this, we've been doing a very good job of trying to focus on the needs. We've come together worldwide and we've brought the education to the areas of need. And that's, I'm very proud of that that we do courses in, in rural Kenya, we do courses in Zimbabwe, we do courses in Myanmar. This is, this is most important because that's where the doctors are training and that's where they will take their training forward. We'd like people to mute if they're not speaking. Okay. Importantly, right now in the developing world, the very and I emphasis, and I understand this completely, is on trauma, benign tumors, and hydrocephalus. And that's really where we have started, where we have said, we've gone to the Ministry of Health and say, if we really start neurosurgery in this region of Cameroon or Zimbabwe or Congo, we can change your trauma system because trauma patients die of their head injury for the most part. And if we can address that, we have a regional system of trauma, which would address things. Benign tumor returns people to productive work and hydrocephalus is the linchpin of congenital anomalies of children. These make sense, but the future will change and it should change. And that's because there are many other areas we must master to be complete neurosurgeons spine, for example, and we're beginning to think in fiends to train in spine, peripheral nerve, functional. Functional because people will be needing to have their brain repaired, not just stop the damage, but how do I repair? And that's where functional will be. But the huge immediate unmet met need is stroke. And that is even more important in the developing world each year compared to when I started international work decades ago. And the rationale is clear. If you begin to understand, and I started this over 40 years ago, when I understood that stroke would dominate at least the patients I would see in their preventable neurologic declines. And that meant I needed to understand the science, the pathophysiology to develop and use the techniques. That's what mentors should do. And so in my own world, I emphasized atherosclerosis. And the rationale became clear in the United States over the last four decades and is becoming clear over this decade in the developing world. And that stroke is relatively simple etiology, but has massive impact. 
not only because the brain dominates so much of the vascular supply of the body, but also its extreme eloquence. Or aging of vessels in arms, legs, etc., may be of importance in your function or athletic prowess. In the brain, it translates into changes not just of motor or vision or speech, but of cognition, about emotion, about knowing your family, about the basis of life. And is relatively simple if we think about it, hemorrhagic and ischemic. And the I want to emphasize today for the ischemic stroke, the major role of atherosclerosis, the treatable, avoidable, that's why we must know the risk factors, surgically acceptable, accessible cause of so many strokes. We first understood that strokes weren't thrombosis in brain vessels, but rather the majority were artery to artery emboli of ischemic nature. 1951, C. Miller Fisher first determined that. And of the treatable causes, the sources of the emboli which go to the brain and vessels plug causing loss of function, whether you recognize it or not as a loss of motor or speech, it is a loss of function, usually turning out to be loss of cognitive function. I tell my students that these emboli which shower from heart and vessels such as the carotid bifurcation, we in our lab show before they cause stroke, before they cause dementia, Alzheimer's, loss of memory, about 10 years before they start to show a loss of creativity, judgment, and problem solving. These are essential to our nature. And I tell my students that this reminds me of the US Congress loss of creativity, judgment, and problem solving. Um, so maybe we should look at this as a more of an important uh, issue. So many years ago, I challenged the joint section of cerebrovascular neurosurgery to rethink their priorities. Because while stroke was devastating people, the neurosurgeons were emphasizing hemorrhagic stroke only. 95% of the meeting was hemorrhagic stroke basically AVMs and aneurysms, even less on hypertensive strokes and 5% on ischemic stroke, but that's where the patients were. And we need to redirect there. This becomes even more important when I think about the developing world. The estimates of how many strokes are present are vastly underreported. The US thinks they're between three quarters and a million in the US. But that is only looking at the ones where people say, I'm devastated, I'm in a nursing home. What about the people that lose cognitive Well, that's 11 million. It's a massive number of people. As we get better and better imaging, we begin to identify both these silent strokes that have cumulative impact and the hemorrhages, which have cumulative impact and often pre-stage or warn of the devastating stroke to follow. So I argue strongly that the patient need is there and it will become very evident in low and middle income countries. In the next decade, stroke will surpass infection as the number one cause of death and disability in the middle and low income countries. And it's because A, we're living longer and B, our risk factors are terrible, diet, smoking, et cetera. This will dominate. And neurosurgeons need to take a, take a lead role, both in the surgery, but also the prevention of this disorder and these disabilities. Now, I really feel that our training programs, even in the low-income countries, can embrace these issues. And I'm going to spend the majority of the time talking about what we can do today with relatively simple tools to really become leaders in the fight against stroke as neurosurgeons. But I'm going to hold out for us the fact that we will use the third technique to really, really be the leaders in the coming decade. So this is a simple tool. 
and simple tools are what we need, portable, etc. This is ultrasound. And if you look at ultrasound and do it properly, the amount of information you can achieve on people at risk is amazing. This just gives you an idea of some of the fidelity here. This is a carotid, common carotid, internal carotid, external. And you can see at the turbulent area, this is 25% of your cardiac outputs going to the brain. Very high flow to very small vessels. The turbulence calls back, causes back wall injury, subendothelial, and that subendothelial process of proliferation, which is enhanced by smoking, by diet, by cholesterol, but probably even more so by aging of your cholesterol, which causes it to be deposited in those areas of injury. Therefore, the high flow turbulence areas are the carotid bifurcations, the coronary orifices, the aortic bifurcation. Of those, the one that is able to recognize symptoms from small emboli is the brain. And here you can see this plaque is ulcerated. This is an ultrasound, very safe, very simple. You can see the source of the symptoms of a stroke. And you can use this tool to assess your surgical techniques. This is 100% of the plaque removed, zero stenosis remaining, zero embolic uh, plaque remaining, and you can see my suture line lined up with the ultrasound beam here. It's that good of a tool and relatively simple. Should be made available if you want to say, well, I need to be involved in this, it's possible. And indeed, when I realized that, I published a series of articles saying that if, you, if I could look at your carotid bifurcation and see how thick your plaque was, it would follow exactly how much you had smoked as a population, not an individual person. If I were to see that the carotid was thickening, the wall was being injured, I could tell you what the chances were that you had, had already had a coronary artery disease or an MI or peripheral vascular disease. And I could assess the success of the surgery. For example, I could get complications well below 1.5%. In my own uh, series of 1,500 cases, the, the complication rate is well below 10, it's in tenths of a percent. Uh, and the efficacy of returning people to normal the stroke risk after successful surgery for a symptomatic carotid is about eightfold less than the medical therapy. And I could follow whether they re stenosed or whether we got all of the plaque out. Indeed, I could show a re stenosis rate well below 1% with a microscopic closure, and more and more microscopes are available worldwide. Simple microscopes, this can be a fixed scope because. There's not a lot of movement in the area you're looking at. And I could restore the lumen to within tenths of a millimeter of the predicted maximal lumen, and it would stay. And that was important. That meant this was something we should learn about. We should take charge. And the reason I began interested in this was I had to know the science. I couldn't simply say, I want to learn a technique and move on. And the science is that it's not really the size, it's the actual reactivity of the plaque, which is deposited in the wall of the vessel. So a surgeon must split this wall, remove that plaque. But when I did remove the plaque, I could study it. So I could learn the pathophysiology and risk factors of the disease. And that meant I collaborate with the scientists at my institutions. And that's what I want us all to do. If we make stroke part of our training program, it will become part of the training program of the scientists we collaborate with at the med schools where we work and teach. That's as true in Africa, in Asia, South America, Central America, as it is in the United States. And so I began to think about it. Well, what causes one person's vessel to develop a plaque and another not to. And that has to be in our genes, not necessarily inherited genes. These could be the epigenetic changes in genes which cause a disease to, to, to become present. 
And so I collaborate. I collaborate with the genetic people, which we all have at our institutions. And I said, could we look at the genes of the plaques from symptomatic and asymptomatic vessels? And we did. 240 different genes are upregulated if the plaque is symptomatic, if they've been having and if they've been having symptoms. And the types of genes are fascinating. These plaques in the wall of the carotid vessel look like a neoplasm. They have RNA and DNA turnover. They have single signal transduction like a neoplasm. They may respond to those sorts of treatments. Importantly, they co-locate co with diseases of dementia as if atherosclerosis is part of a systemic aging of the central nervous system. And they co-locate co with defects in our ability to retard inflammation. So plaques are very inflamed, suggesting other treatment options. And really important things, they, sh they show an attempt to make abnormal tiny micro vessels to try to feed themselves. And those vessels can bleed. So bleeding into a plaque becomes symptomatic, whether it's in the heart or the carotid or brain. I became even more interested. If indeed the problem with a carotid plaque is that it breaks loose and pieces fly to the brain, I want to know which plaques, and this is a plaque, you can see it's on both walls of this lumen, this is common, this is internal, this is the stenotic area, but the flow pushing through this plaque is fracturing the plaque. And these stress lines in the plaque show exactly what I'm talking about, that it is a vascularly related phenomena that I can quantify which people's plaques need to be removed by the stress I see in them. Because I then measured the emboli in the brain and found those were the people that were having emboli if the plaques were breaking apart. And those are the people that had cognitive and classic strokes. So it means that we need to pay attention to people's brains, not simply whether or not they're paralyzed, but whether or not they're able to have cognitive function because nothing is more important to a patient. You do not want one of the elders to no longer be able to know or recognize their children, their grandchildren. And this instability of the plaque predicted the cognitive decline and the emboli, and the new vessels that formed would shatter the plaque, and the genetic markers which locate with degenerative diseases. But from a surgical standpoint, if the plaque was unstable, I could predict that they would have brain dysfunction, which is micro and macro strokes. And most importantly, if I remove the plaque, I stop the strokes virtually greatly decreased TIAs, a decreased emboli, and stabilized cognition. Cognitive decline, which is always felt to be inevitable if caused by this process, is stopped by the surgeon. That's really profound. It means this is something we should be doing. Okay. Now, it gets more interesting. If emboli from the heart or the carotids are the cause of the stroke, if we intervene quickly enough, can we reverse it? Well, this is that third technique I talked about, the one we all must master because our patients need it. And people will tell me the equipment's too expensive. I don't believe it. We can modify just as the microscopes used to be too expensive and we modify. And so that's what's coming because we discovered 41 year old person presents with death left hemiparesis. The entire middle cerebral is lost. Anterior cerebral remains. The patient literally looks at you and says, am I going to be like this, paralyzed on my left side for the rest of my life? The answer is, unless I do something, you'll be dead because of the brain swelling. I either have to take the skull off and allow this area of the brain to be lost to try to save the brainstem, 
or I could go through the vessel and snag that embolus. If I can snag the embolus, I might reopen it if I can do it in time. This is the pre-op, this is the post-op. Complete resolution of the blockage goes home to spouse and child four days later. This would have been a fatal stroke in prior times and still is a fatal stroke throughout much of the world. This is a surgical disease. We must train for it, we must prepare for it. That's the third technique that I want people to master during their career. The first two I'll talk about, surgery on brain, open surgery on brain, open surgery on carotids, because I want all of us to emphasize that. But these results of pulling clots out of the brain in 2015, four studies showed that 40% of the people with the large clots in their middle cerebral, if they were approached in a timely fashion, could reverse the stroke. Almost 80% we could get the best open, but as far as reversing the stroke, this was possible. This means neurosurgeons worldwide, low, middle, and high income countries need to embrace this technique or prepare to. That's the third technique. So I argue the total treatment of stroke is the prevention, understand the risk factors, and teach that. I actually run a program on our Native American reservation in, the, in my home state here to decrease the risk factors to try to decrease the strokes before they develop these blockages. That's part of my job. But when they happen, I have to open that blockage, remove the embolic source, or remove the clot itself. Some of these treatments are possible today, some in our future. Let's look at that. I think that all neurosurgeons must know cerebral vascular disease. Prevention, diagnosis, open treatment of hemorrhagic, that includes aneurysms and clots, which are survivable, and open treatment of ischemic. And be prepared to learn the endovascular. We have to, themes and the worldwide organizations, make sure that those treatments, which are now proven, are available in the low and middle income countries as well. And you, the young neurosurgeons, are going to be duly trained. That's my goal. These are the two techniques I want you to understand and know, the ones everybody should know today. The first is micro dissection in the brain in arachnoid planes. Now, this is the technique we use for aneurysms. All of us, all the young trainees want to master this. There are two reasons. One, you save lives. That's a very good reason. Two, these techniques are transferable to every brain operation, be they functional or tumor, et cetera. This idea, this concept of doing surgery in the arachnoid planes is based on a 1930s technique, Norman Dott, great Scottish neurosurgeon, of extensile exposure. I want to get deep down this fissure, the sylvian fissure, I widely open the arachnoid and I open it sharply, in this case with a fine diamond knife or an arachnoid knife, or I used a TB syringe needle to open the arachnoid. But the point is that when I open it widely, the leaves of the brain, the lobes fall open without damage to the brain. And this technique must be transferable to everything you do. So if we look here at this short video, we see that as we sharply open arachnoid, we expose our anatomy. That's what we're supposed to be doing. In this case, the carotid. But I find the carotid by first looking at the cranial nerves. I carefully look beneath the frontal lobe for the first nerve. It always leads me to the second nerve which leads me to the carotid. If I open that arachnoid, I have got my proximal control or I'm ready for a skull base tumor, but I'm doing it sharply. And as I do it sharply, tissue falls and separates apart. The optic nerve comes into view. And as I work distally along the vessel, I expose the middle cerebral. 
and here you can see the lenticular striates. The lenticular striates, the perforators, are absolutely essential to be preserved. Our job is to always slow down, it's actually faster, see your anatomy, describe it. You can see the perforators coming into view, you can see the landmark anterior cerebral, and then as we dissect, we begin to see the aneurysm, of course, but most importantly, the relationship to perforators and such as lenticular striates. We preserve vessels. That's what a vascular surgeon does, but all of us need to be vascular surgeons. Now, this particular middle cerebral aneurysm is enveloped by the lenticular striates and even adhered to one, but you'll see that just by using careful, sharp dissection, you open the fascial planes, the arachnoid, and you never damage brain, and you preserve vessels. There are techniques that we use here, but these are common techniques that we all should know. So we see uh, vessels to the uncus. And then now this is, sort of, this is unusual. It's cheating, I know, but this is ICG green. This is a higher level microscope to be able to do through my scope an interoperative angio to identify these perforators, to make sure they're flowing well and I maintain their flow. Now, I've never used this in Africa, South America, Asia, et cetera, when I've taught these techniques, but I would hope that the, that the scopes available in the mid low and middle income countries will have it in the future. It's not necessary, it's an adjunct. And actually, many of these are diagnosed by CTA, computer. But here you can see a very good example that this aneurysm actually has a bleb and a, a lenticular striate adherent to the bleb, the weak spot, the usual bleeding point. And that has to be sharply dissected because if you do that, you can clearly see and preserve everything. The point isn't how to do an aneurysm, it's how to handle tissue. And as you see, because of concern about that, we temporarily clip very quickly the middle cerebral. My studies suggest you have between five and 15 minutes to do this, I prefer five. Sharply dissect, take the temporaries off, and then a very specialized clip preserves the, all of the perforators, separates them from, from the aneurysm, encircles the middle cerebral and closes the aneurysm. Now that's only possible if you dissected it all out. And then our ICG green allows us to see aneurysm flat, perforators perfect. This is what we're trying to achieve. But what we just learned is that these are techniques they're applicable throughout your surgery. I do not claim that this is a major part of your surgery in the developing world, but it is a technique you'll be able to use on everything. That's the first technique, micro dissection in the brain. That's why we're teaching microscopes because your population deserves that treatment, whether it's a tumor, an aneurysm, et cetera. Now, the second technique I want everyone to know is that carotid technique. And the carotid technique is very important because it talks about how do you handle tissue and how do you understand the pathophysiology of a disease? Because I believe that this operation, very easy to be done throughout the world, greatly decreases stroke risk, especially those that are related to smoking and dietary problems of atherosclerosis. And what we have here is an example of a symptomatic right carotid. And what I say here is I study everything. The CTA is perfectly fine. I don't need an angiogram. But I look to see if the neck will turn so I can approach the area. I have ultrasounds. And I develop an OR in a team that's used to this, because if they're used to this, it goes smoothly and quickly. I identify surface landmarks. 
and everybody has their own individual techniques. But what I want you to know is what I'm saying is have a team and have a system. Diagnosis can be made with CTA and with ultrasound and symptoms. Sorry. This is a symptomatic right carotid. It's asymptomatic in the long class. I look at the bones to easily flex In an extremely obese patient, tissue planes are not as so this is an example of opening, and the beauty of this operation is you only cut one muscle, the platysma, so it's very painless. To allow the jugular to be contracted laterally, exposing the... The next landmark are the veins, so the muscles, the anterior triangle of the neck. We all learned that in anatomy. We adapt it. I come along the sternocleidomastoid, reflect it, I expose the jugular. To reflect that, I have to disengage the facial vein. And obviously, if I can do that, I'm going to expose the carotid. The, carotid. Protecting the, tenth nerve. the next concern is the nerves, because I'm all automatically you know, entranced by the carotid. But I must know the 10th nerve, the 12th nerve, the 9th nerve, and how to protect them. Here I'm dissecting the symptomatic internal, the bifurcation, the common. The 12th nerve, fibers of the 9th nerve, the 10th nerve, circumferential I routinely transpose the 12th nerve for distal exposure. And then I have a system of occluding above and below the plaque. So what we've learned here is that this is a surgical technique which you can do. It's quite useful. It's tremendously effective in decreasing stroke. And if you have a system to remove the plaque from this area of the internal and common, you'll be able to massively decrease strokes. There is system to it. You need to stop distal emboli first, then get proximal control, get the external control, open the, open the vessel with a plaque. You'll see normal vessel below, normal vessel above. And here are pot scissors. These are very straightforward tools. And now what we've done is we've exposed the plaque itself. As we free it from the vessel, it becomes its own entity, which I can study in my laboratory, but it completely removes the disease. I go down to normal intima and up to normal intima. Everything in the middle is that focal plaque where the turbulence had created it. And when I remove that, I've actually eliminated this source of disease. You can see how abnormal the plaque is, but how normal the remaining vessel is. Which once that is completed, then run. You can see in the closure that the remaining vessel is completely normal. It does need to have antiplatelets, and I heparinize during the case. So I do the entire case totally anticoagulated. The point is, is that these are techniques which can be done anywhere in the world on patients of need. And as you become sufficiently qualified in cerebral vascular disease, hemorrhagic and ischemic, you become very important in the stroke program, in the nation stroke prevention program, because you are an expert in that. 
but the future is even more exciting because the endovascular techniques will become easier and easier and more available. Expensive equipment becomes cheaper. It always happens. Expensive coils will be replaced by straightforward, uniform techniques. And there are many. Flow diversions, which are called covered stents, new coils, liquid embolics, and improved antiplatelets to keep clots from forming in vessels. I truly believe that we need to start in the next decade training everyone because the future of the repair of the injured brain is gonna be through the vessel. My lab right now is working on the growth factors that will transform a brain into repair. In other words, after a stroke, your brain tries to repair itself, but fails. It's trying to recapitulate the way it made itself in the fetus. And yet those genes are still present if we add those growth factors, we see in the lab that this repair begins to take place. Those growth factors are going to be delivered by neurosurgeons endovascularly. Therefore, this is an important part where stroke meets repair of the brain. And I want cerebrovascular disease to be on first of mind for all of our trainees, including in my country and yours. So we take, must take the lead in prevention and treatment. Here, our chief resident is learning techniques in a simulator, but obviously it's an integral part of our training program. One chief resident did over 900 endovascular cases as part of their training, for example, because I believe what fiends can offer is this idea of dyads of education, linking established programs with developing programs, an international curriculum, our international boot camps, emphasizing everything, and it will include cerebral vascular, linking sites electronically as we're doing now, focusing scholarships, partnering to purchase, ship, and maintain equipment. You notice the first two techniques, you've already got most of that equipment. You need a microscope, you need some micro instruments, you need practice. The third one, the endovascular, we need to work on less expensive endovascular equipment to allow us to do the base endovascular cases. It's gonna take a decade, but the first two steps we can start now with cerebral vascular. The more I do that, the more the push will be for us to do complete cerebrovascular care. Because this idea benefits all, obviously our patients. It benefits our, our trainees in the developing countries. It benefits our trainees and professors in the established programs. And it benefits patients worldwide because I learn more when I go to Africa than I teach. I'm always aware of that because it's all about being present, developing dyads, helping people worldwide, philanthropists to develop equipment, education. And it's about caring about this, being a full professional because the work we do and the teaching we do is based on the research we collaborate with, but only makes sense if it's in direct response to a patient need, the patients we see every day. So I want to thank you and leave you with my favorite quote from Cushing about the idea that we do not simply treat an organ or a surgery technique. We treat the whole person and the man or woman in the world. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Ignatius, I'd be glad to answer any questions that people would have. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dempsey. Uh, the floor is open for questions. There is one already in the chat box from uh, Beverly. Uh, Beverly from Kenya. She says, thank you for your excellent talk. Simulation is a key part of training. What advice would you give on, uh, uh, give on surgeons setting, on surgeons setting up simulation sessions for their own practice and for teaching? 
Well, Beverly, thank you. I consider this one of the most important parts of our small fellowships where we bring people to places for three months and they don't simply learn how to do things on our simulators. They take home how to set them up in their own country. The so Dr. Bashkaya's lab here, for example, have come up with some very simple low tech ways to make simulations. We use them at the boot camps. So the, the, the format will be through the boot camps to try to teach people how to practice. And you know, some of them are magnificent. Uh, some of the dissections which we do with a fixed microscope uh, have really taught most of the stimulations. The harder one is the endovascular, which is really going to take me the next 10 years to be able to bring that bar up in the developing world. So I admit I've emphasized those open techniques, which allow you to be sufficient today. Uh, and a lot of the how to I make a simulation lab is what we need to teach at the boot camps as they restart, I hope later in this year, if vaccinations go well. Uh, and at the uh, fellowships, the Fiends uh, Bassett fellowships, where people might come for three months to a center, such as ours that has those simulations, and we can work together to see which ones are portable to your own country. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dempsey. Please feel free to ask your questions. Uh, Professor Dempsey, uh, there's a question maybe not directly related to your presentation today, or not related to uh, stroke. Uh, most of the, uh, the young neurosurgeons always ask uh, at the moment due to COVID-19, how, how maybe, when is it possible maybe to become a fellow, a Fins fellow in the, in the nearest future? Well, thank you. Thanks mainly to Dr. Rousseau's excellent help and the board of Fins. We are going forward with two types of fellowships. One is, the, uh, is, the, is a virtual fellowship which we'll be uh, advertising, where people will be virtually paired to a professor, perhaps two or three trainees, who say I have a particular interest in skull base or endovascular, et cetera. And they will work, we hope, weekly, virtually, with the professor on projects, et cetera, so that, that will start. Our goal, of course, would be that would then lead to in-person, which my hope was later in 2021, I'm watching how well the vaccinations go, but we will get there and we will. So we are ongoing training people virtually to be fellows. There are still opportunities for CLAC fellowships where people are able to be assisted with their uh, finances of their training in their own region, which of course may not have the amount of COVID we do in the United States. So um, my hope is that this will come late in 2021. I'm not hopeful about the early half of 2021 yet. Thank you. Um, there's another question from, uh, okay, there's a question from Doug Moore. He says, thanks a lot for the knowledge you are sharing today. I sincerely uh, appreciate your concern for training basic surgical care in developing countries. On the slide with MCA uh, thromboembolism, between surgical embolectomy and medical uh, thrombolysis, which one appears safer and have you been and have better outcome for the patients? Excellent question. So let's think about what our drugs, which are quite expensive, and our embolectomies have done. Now, intravenous thrombolysis, which is the hallmark of stroke therapy, on average improves 4% of the stroke patients. That's very expensive for the return. It's nice, it's better than not treating people. And that's across everyone. For large clots in the middle cerebral, the most devastating and fatal strokes, it's virtually ineffective. Okay. We know that if we then took the thrombolytic agent and put it into arterially into the plaque, we had some wonderful outcomes, but on average, it wasn't worth it. Too many bad outcomes. 
when we reached in and grabbed the plaque with a snare and pulled it out, 40% recovered. That compared to four or none. So for the right patient, surgical endovascular thrombolectomy is the right thing. It, however, is only available because they came in on time or they had the right configuration of a clot on a minority of ischemic strokes. So the answer is a complex one, but I see medical thrombolysis as an adjunct with the real therapy coming from selecting patients with the big clots we can pull out and then developing techniques for the little ones, which is probably a combination of those therapies. Thank you. Uh, there's another question from Sega. Sega is from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. He says, thank you very much, Professor Dempsey, for an educative talk. Is carotid in the with local anesthesia an option, especially in a setting like ours? Yes, it is. There's no question that the uh, general, or I gave an example of a general anesthesia case, but a local anesthesia is quite possible. It is a common technique. And I think it should be tailored to the individual patient. It is not necessarily safer. Um, I tend to use general anesthesia, but I have very experienced anesthesiologists. Other practices, such as some of my friends in this country, use much more uh, local anesthesia quite successfully. The key is a cooperative patient, but it, it absolutely can be done. Just to add to that, uh, Professor Dempsey, in the absence of a microscope, uh, can, would you advise maybe a young neurosurgeon in a developing setting to do carotid in the, in the arteriotomy with a loop, a surgical loop? There's no microscope. I, I would have to say that uh, a large number of my original cases were done with loops only. Uh, it certainly is quite possible and it is safe. I feel that I'm a better surgeon with the microscope and once I got a microscope, I trained on everything. My family accused me of tying my shoelaces with a microscope to make sure <laughs> I would be practiced. Um, and I find that really adds to it. Now, you notice that my restenosis rate is ridiculously low. I credit that to the ability to really refine the inside of the vessel with the microscope to see every little possible flaw and to remove them. So I think the microscope adds value. It is not a necessity, but it adds value. So absolutely, yeah. yes, it can be done with groups. Okay. Thank you, sir. In a headlight, you can do most things. <laughs> okay, okay, sir. Yeah, there's another question from Beverly. Beverly, Beverly is in Nairobi, Kenya. He says, would Fiends consider sponsoring and supporting creation of fellowships and boot camps led by Fiends fellows in African, African countries? as it, is, it will be easier to travel within the continent in the near future. Absolutely. My concept of boot camps is that one half of the teachers of a boot camp, first of all, the boot camp should be located close to the trainees. A really successful boot camp is centrally located. For example, our Bolivia boot camp draws people from five low-income South American countries to that area with support, et cetera. Uh, similar as you know, when we did it in Zimbabwe or in, in, in Kenya. Uh, now, it is imperative to me that one half of the teachers at the boot camp be local. And the ideal are our graduate trainees because two good things happen when they teach. One, they are elevated in the eye and stature in the eyes of their colleagues, their patients, the administrators, the officials. Second, they learn they can teach. These are bright, bright people, and I want them to be confident that they can teach. And if they work alongside somebody like Dr. Rousseau, who is so encouraging, they say, yes, I can do this. In Bolivia, these nice doctors said, my goodness, that person who I thought was my rival is actually very talented. I think I will work closer with them. And they founded a national neurosurgical teaching institute. 
That's always been my goal, to break down rivalries, to elevate the trainees, to have them teach. So absolutely, that is our goal. It's a great idea. Thanks for mentioning. Yes, sir. Any more questions? There's a comment from Natalie. Natalie is in Cote d'Ivoire. She's doing a training in neurosurgery. She says, thank you so much, Professor, for your presentation. Um, I really want to say how grateful I am for this opportunity. I, um, you know, this is something I credit Dr. Rousseau completely. We bring all the trainees together and we begin to understand that we're, we're battling the same problems worldwide. My life has been quite hectic this past year because we've had a tremendous COVID problem here in my, my hometown. And all of the patients still got sick. All the tumors still happened. All the babies were born and way more strokes took place probably because of COVID. So we have been working seven days a week um, and it's been hard. And so um, I think it's important to know we're all in this together, but we have not forgotten. We'll come together virtually and in person as soon as possible. Okay. It's really, I can't thank you enough. There is a question from uh, Luxwell. He's in uh, <coughs> Harare for Sakalangu. So he says, in the future, do you envision surgical interventions such as endovascular or otherwise to treat early cognitive deficits due to plaques? See, I envision that during your careers, you will treat these diseases such as degenerative diseases or post-traumatic diseases of the brain. And you will treat them, I believe endovascularly, not by removing a plaque, but by adding a growth factor and you will be part of repair of the brain. That's gonna take place over the next 20 years, uh, but you will be the people that lead that. And all you need to do is be trained in the tools. And yes, right now, I think the loss of cognition, if it's proven to be due to a stroke mechanism, can be affected by removing the plaque. But right now, it's not a primary indication. It is something that's in, in addition to the standard indication. Gail, did you want to do a summation there? I yes, really I, want I would love to do that. Thank you. Really I'm mindful of the time as well. Ignatius of, was a trainee, uh, of course, with us in Madison here. And we're very proud of him, both of his, with his work for young neurosurgeons worldwide, uh, as well as his own work in his native Cameroon. Um, and it's inspirational, as all of you are. Gail, please, if you could help us finish. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dempsey and Dr. Asin. I really enjoyed that. And I, I just wanna pause as we're finishing here to reflect on what an important thing we just participated in and witnessed today. You know, we all care about global surgery and the basic uh, human right of having accessible, timely, affordable care, surgical care available to everyone everywhere. And meetings like this move us in that direction, move the world in that direction. We are together moving toward a global curriculum. Dr. Dempsey has just given the same talk that he would give to his residence in Madison or to a meeting at the AANS. Uh, and so we are together working to create a community of concerned surgical humanitarians and scientists. And through the wonders of video platform technology, we're able to do that. We're doing it during COVID, but we'll also be doing it after the pandemic. This lecture of Dr. Dempsey's will be available on the Fiend's website. I encourage you to refer your other colleagues to it or to review it if there are things that are of interest to you and to spread the word about this community and this series of lectures. The next one will be in two months, 
I don't know if we have a slide to show that or not, but yeah, uh, there is. Oh, great. If you wouldn't mind putting that up, Dr. Asin, that would be great. As you know, the, the format is every other month this year as we're starting and it will go to monthly. Uh, and the way we're doing this is to have the host be a younger uh, prior fellow or a, an aspirant to be a Fiends fellow and the speaker who's speaking on topics of your choosing uh, will be a more senior uh, experienced neurosurgeon from the Fiends community. Um, I think we have a little bit of a change in the schedule. I think uh, the next one is probably gonna be myself with Juliet Sikobunga from Uganda, but we'll keep this available on the Fiends website and be distributing it out through our mailing list. But we're so eager to create this community and this curriculum with you. So please give us feedback. You're, you're part of the inaugural effort. Uh, you're the, the idea and the focus of all of this. And this is of course the future of global neurosurgery, our beloved shared profession and of neurosurgical care for the world. Um, I think with that, I will thank Dr. Dempsey. I'll thank Dr. Asin. I'll thank uh, Dr. Ulrich Sidney who yes. coordinated this. Uh, Stevie uh, who works in Dr. Dempsey's office and the many of you who spread the word are uh, some members of our board of directors of Fiends are here. I see Dr. Rock, Jack Rock, who will be a future speaker as well. And we look forward to uh, growing this project and uh, moving forward together in global neurosurgery. With that, have a great Saturday, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Do take care. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you.